at the uh... all right so um this is a talk about message format two uh for those of you who don't know me i'm addison phillips i'm a lifetime unicode member uh, I chair the W3C's Internationalization Working Group, and uh, it's fallen to me to chair the uh, message format uh, subcommittee of CLDR um, at Unicode. Um, we do our work in GitHub. This is our GitHub address. It'll be at the end, so you don't have to write it down just this second. Um, but. Uh, if you are at all interested in the stuff I'm talking about today, we welcome participation. We need your help in order to drive this standard through. Um, I've been involved with some interesting standards with long gestation in the past. Uh, um, Charmod took something like 10 years. Uh, Mark's in the back laughing, thinking about the 70 internet drafts that BCP 47 took and message format ah no big deal it'll take us a year or so and here we are three or so years later and by god we are going to finish it this year uh for the spring release um i hope <laughs> so uh, i'm going to talk about several different things today one of them is why you need a message formatter at all in your lives uh, and then i'm going to talk about why we need a new message formatter um, and then a little bit about what's in message format too and, and then we're going to do some audience participation. We're going to do some standardization right here in the room, per, uh, perhaps. So, um, so let's start with why you need a message formatter. Um, this might be an important part of the first program you ever wrote, even if you only took like one programming class uh, uh, in your life. And uh, obviously, it has a, an IETN bug in it. That string "Hello World" is hard coded, and so. Uh, to internationalize software, generally what you do um, is you separate um, the strings, the user interface from your code, and you put them in resource files. Um, and then there's a locale that is used to look up the correct resource file at runtime, and therefore you can have a localized uh, piece of software. That separation is important uh, because software developers can then focus on writing software the business logic and the source resource files for the user interface and there's another group of people who are the localizers engineers translators and so forth who take the uh to take those resource files and translate them into other languages and produce a product that is actually useful uh, in another language or culture we were hearing about Adlam a few minutes ago one of the challenges is not that Adlam exists, it's that there's no software in Adlam, right? So uh, this is how software gets into another language. And this other group of people is important for message formatting. Their cycle times vary, and they don't, we generally don't want the localization process to interrupt the development of software. Uh, developers don't want to wait to check in their code for the German translator to wake up. Um, but there is a dependency there. There's nothing to translate until there are source resources, until source code is, uh, is created. And then, of course, finally, once a, a software product's been created, um, it doesn't necessarily require developers to produce a target language product. And so you can add languages to a product uh, without software developers if you've done the internationalization correctly. So... The second program you probably ever wrote was something that produced output that looks sort of like this. And a naive implementation of that, here's a terrible version in Java, is, uh, oh, hello, plus username, plus exclamation point at the end um, to, produce, um, to produce the output. I'll use a slightly more interesting example uh, for why that, because that should be a message format, why that message formatting is important in the second program you ever wrote. So here's a little program, a uh, demo program I use for, for different IETN tutorials. It's a tic-tac-toe program and you could play tic-tac-toe with people and, and maybe a message would say, you win some percentage of your matches. Here is 
you win some percent of your matches in several different languages, Turkish, Japanese, Malayalam. I, I picked somewhat at random. Well, not entirely at random. If you match the words you win to the first sentence that's there, or the first part of the sentence that's there in the translations, you're in for a surprise because those words actually in each of these languages happen to mean of your matches and not you win. The words have changed order. If you had two separate strings, the you win string is not going to be translated by translators to mean of your matches, right? There's no way to do that with concatenation of strings. You need to have this complete string in order to do that. And that's what message format does. Message format also allows us to do things like switch the order of replacement variables due to the difference in the grammar and structure of different target languages. I think there's a deeper reason, though, why message format is kind of interesting to me as an internationalization um, engineer and, and leader. Um, Old-fashioned uh, software uses maybe dialog boxes. And the code behind a dialog box like this looks something, this is in JavaScript, uh, might look something like this. It's internationalized. And in the code, there is a big block of text that somebody has to type in there to get this output to be internationalized. And there's a software developer on the end of that. And as a professional, I have to go find that developer and teach them to use these internationalized APIs and their options. And there are a lot of developers in the world and there are a lot of programming languages in the world, and there are a lot of different ways that people can, can be doing things wrong. There are a lot of different APIs. Oh, look, I've taught you numbers. Now I uh, taught you dates. Now I get to teach you about numbers. Oh, yay. And then measurements, right? So we'd like to get to a point where, where we can sort of dilute the amount of knowledge that people have to have in order to internationalize things. Also, nobody writes dialog boxy user interfaces anymore, do they? When was the last time your UX designer brought you something like that? They're bringing you stuff that looks more like this, and these much more fluent, friendly user interfaces have sentences, and they have interesting problems such as gender agreements, um, you know, count agreements, and so forth. And you can do that with spaghetti code. This is JavaScript to implement that as spaghetti code in your in your in there, and uh, and that's great. Except the UX designer will come and change how they want things, and so a software developer has to go in and change the individual options for each of the the dates and the numbers and the and so forth in the code. They have to make a code change in order to implement a, a user interface change and test that and release that and keep track of which version is which. So what's the solution to that? Well, we've had a message formatter for 30 years in Java. Um, and ICU has had a more capable version for many, many years. Uh, and it, has, it uses pattern strings that look something like this. They're curly black bracket um, placeholders that are replaced with data values at runtime. And what's interesting is the code for a message format always looks the same. You get the pattern string, you hand it to message format, you collect up the data you'd like it to format into the message, and you format it. The code never has to change as long as you don't want to add an additional data value that you want to pass to the formatter. And you can collect data that it's not even using currently. And so I've worked on systems where I have a big wad of data, every piece of information about a, an item for sale at Amazon. And I can hand all of that to a message formatter and I can just selectively pick what I want to format out of that into a message format pattern. ICU's message formatter extends the one that we find in Java and it has some, some additional things. One of the problems that we have in, in other languages is there's a difference for singular and plural in English. There's a difference for singular and plural. Um, and so you need different strings for that. And there is something in CLDR, plural data, which allows us to create a message pattern 
sort of like this. Notice that the code didn't change in that bottom block, um, but we can select the correct message based on the number of matches that you played. That message has two things in it, so you can nest two plurals within each other to create a completely grammatical set of strings. Um, and, you know, so this is kind of what that would look like in MF1. Uh, I'll mention English, you know, if I had a dollar for every developer who wrote, if number equal one do X, if, you know, else get the, the plural string, I could retire. Oh, wait, I am retired. <laughs> Turns out other languages don't work that way. I'm not going to do a whole tutorial on how plurals work, but I'll point out that there are a bunch of different ways that, uh, um, that this can work, and CLDR captures the data to describe that and allows us to... Okay, that slide was timed. Um, okay, so we have message format one. What's wrong with it? We're done, right? We don't need a message format two, so we do. I'll start with the basic thing. Message format doesn't have really great coverage for the formatter APIs that are in ICU, let alone the world at large. Um, bog standard Java covers the top three, and then we get select and plural and a, and a couple of other things. We have a spell out formatter and some things in, in ICU's um, message format. But we're missing a bunch of the newer uh, APIs, the person name formatter isn't there, relative formatting, message for, uh, excuse me, uh, measurement formatting, uh, lists, and so on. And the stuff that is there, people have used in um, problematical ways. The select formatter is the thing that you use when you have an enumerated set of cases. So if you build your own enumerated set of cases in code, you can use it to do bad gender selection bad grammar, you know, grammatical selection and so forth. Where we should have CLDR data and APIs, we have people rolling their own. That's not portable, um, and so that's not very helpful. I have a little illustration there of a bone dragon. We'll see the bone dragon in a little bit. So, um, and then there's no customization. If you write your own formatter, you can't plug it in without taking the code and opening up the code and doing stuff to it. And one of the things that's turned out is that lots of people have opened up the, because it's open source, get the code, go in, do surgery on it. Now my message format can do XYZ format that's special to my company. And so that's a, a challenge. A second level challenge is message formats interface. It's, it's pattern language is, uh, is very regular. It's straightforward. Um, but it's also not exactly set up to make translators happy. So this replacement variable is five curly brackets deep in the syntax of this. And bear in mind, it's not, you don't write that message format in the beautiful way that I had on the slide. You write it like this. This is what it looks like when you're a software developer writing a message format pattern string. It's a lot of fun keeping track of where the curly brackets go and what state you're in and so forth. Now, double replacements are relatively rare, but they're not unheard of. What that leads to is an ITN bug. People look at this API and go, ah, I don't have to write all that noise. I can write my message like this with some of the text outside of the plural selector. I have an example here in Turkish, just for giggles and grins. And you'll notice that that doesn't work because the words outside of the curly brackets there need to change too. And so what we're asking is for translators to completely rewrite the message format pattern string, in fact, recreating that first thing that, this, that the English type developer avoided. That's not very useful because that's not how translation tooling actually works in the real world, and so that's a problem. I kind of mentioned that. I mentioned the bone dragon problem. The other thing that happens is that people want to write these kind of very fluent um, interfaces with very conversational things. Uh, voice interfaces are heavily 
affected by this kind of thing where you have arbitrary values and you want to put them together to form complete sentences. And so you were verbed by monster and monster pronoun had decimation list um, kind of formats. And that's really, it's possible if you have a very constrained case, like in a game, you can enumerate all the kinds of monsters and then you can build what their gender is in different languages and you know, on that kind of thing. You can, you can accomplish this with message format and select format and so on. Um, but when you open this up somewhat, it becomes very complicated very, very quickly. And this is very hard. These are very hard messages to manage, to get translated and so on. There's a lot of pressure not to do this on the one side, and there's a lot of pressure to do it from, from the actual designers who say, why is it so hard to say you were hunted by an elf lord and she mauled one archer? What's so hard about that? Well, they have 5,000 strings in that one resource. And everybody's everybody's gone. Large language models for the win, right? We'll just we'll just do Chat GPT for this, right? It's not in your languages, probably. It's it's probably a problem if what you're really building is a a refrigerator's interface, a light bulb's interface. Lots of different software applications just don't have the power to run a large language model, assuming one existed. So we're not going to solve this real soon now using large language models. We're going to need something. What's happened is interesting. Message format exists. Lots of people have come and taken message format and adapted it for their own personal local needs. Hi, I am part of the problem. I did this at Amazon, right? I, they're not going to fix my message format. I'll fix it for them, darn it. Um, and so there's lots of different things out there for formatting messages. They are not all compatible with message format because everybody had a better idea. It's like a banquet table. You can go in the open source land and find your message formatter and choose from the banquet table. And everybody's convinced that they have the nicest chocolate cake or muffin or whatever the thing is off the buffet table. Um, that's part of their food supply problem. And of course, the classic X, uh, XKCD cartoon applies here, right? <laughs> there, we got 14, we're going to fix it and build, you know, number 15. There's another insidious thing there as well. Because there's so much diversity, there's not a, gr a great tooling on the localization side. There's, I have to explain to every translator what this message format stuff is or build tooling at my company to handle it so that the translators see the right stuff in my special case. And if I change companies, I have to do that all again. Um, it would be really good if we could build things that talk to our tools and our tools talk to the, to the software in the right ways so that we get the right results. That means standards and consistency rather than uh, diversity of innovation. To be truly successful, a message format too needs to be at least part of what I call the water supply, is we stop being something on the buffet table you can pick, but everybody needs water. So we build it into our frameworks, our programming languages, our runtime environments, so that it's there, so you don't have to install anything to get it. And even more ideally, if I don't move my mouse, we get in the air supply. And what I mean by that is, when you go to write a user interface in, let's say, Android Studio, your resource file is automatically already giving you message format to patterns. Your, when you go to use Node, it's right there. When you go to use whatever your environment is, this is how you write strings in our resource format, in the standard resource format, in a standard uh, message format pattern style so that you don't have to think about it which is great for all of us as internationalization professionals because we only have to teach people the one thing and that knowledge becomes transferable. As I mentioned before I retired from Amazon, we were pretty successful at driving this into our templating languages, into our even you know declarative language, template language, runtime environment. Everybody was using the same thing. That reduced the overall burden on the internationalization team because there was only one way to do it. 
And we had answers for how to do that. And if we didn't have the feature, we could build it for you. That was nice. I want everyone to have that. Okay, so what is message format two? We have a logo. <laughs> Our logo features uh, the replacement character. I was gonna have like t-shirts for, for team members, but unfortunately it was really hard to get them to print the replacement. You don't want that, it's broken. No, it's not broken. <laughs> There are basically four parts to message format too. There's an ABNF syntax, there's specifications for syntax and formatting, there's a, a default registry for functions, and there's a test suite. Start by taking a look at the syntax. Um, as I said before, it's, uh, it's an ABNF. Um, and we'll start with a message. This is a familiar, familiar message. This is a message. This is a more interesting message. This is the second program you ever wrote as, as a message. And it has what we, it's a, what we call a pattern because it has a replacement variable in it. And that pattern has a placeholder. The placeholder can have an annotation. And the annotation can consist of a function name. In this case, it's the person format function. And the function can have, um, can have options added onto it to tell it how to format things. So far, fairly familiar, similar in many ways to, to message format one. The functions and their options are in a default registry uh, for the ones that are required to be implemented by all message format two implementations. Your framework or even your own code can add on um, additional functions or additional uh, options to, uh, to the core functions that are specified. So it's extensible in multiple, in multiple ways, depending on either the programming environment you're in or, uh, or your, own local, your own local needs. Um, it, because I say we have a registry, that doesn't mean that your implementation will have a, a registry file to go look at. It may be that it's just coded into your implementation, but there is a thing that says, if you are an MF2 uh, implementation, you have to have these functions with these options and these option values. Um, and you should have a way to extend using, uh, using a standardized uh, format. There's some different kinds of operands you can have. The most familiar, of course, is just a variable. The variable you pass in is the variable you'd like to insert into the string. But there's some other things that you can put into, into a placeholder. You can put a literal, which is just a string. Um, some literals can be unquoted um, because they don't have spaces and other things that conflict with the syntax. Interesting ones would be numbers. You can have an unquoted number literal uh, in a placeholder. Um, or you can go without an operand, and in some cases you could have a function, you just call the function directly, you can pass options to that function, but you don't, uh, uh, you don't have to uh, um, pass an operand to it in all cases. Literals are a little funny. Um, in MF2, literals are quoted with the pipe symbol, the ASCII pipe character. Um, rather than, than quotes, quote marks, and I'll come back to why that is in a little bit. Or as I mentioned, you can have uh, unquoted literals. Um, you've already seen literals in a place you probably didn't expect them. That's in the when statement in the plurals. Uh, the one keyword is a literal. Literals can be used for funny things in MF2. Uh, one of the interesting things you can do is you can insert a hard-coded value into a string and cause it to be formatted according to the locale. So rather than having the translator deal with, should I shape the digits for 47, you can have the runtime shape the digits for 47 for you. So far, we've looked at what we call simple messages. Um, there are also what we call complex messages. Um, what does that mean? Well, there's a couple things that a complex message can have. If you have a placeholder and it has a lot of options, maybe what you'd like to do is take them out of the pattern string that the translator has to look at 
even if they're using a translation tool that hides that stuff, it's not it's not something that they need to be messing with. So you can move it to a declaration, in this case, an input declaration that says, hey, that, that value date, um, you should use the date function for that. And then here are all the options I want you to use. And then you can, uh, the translator only has to look at the pattern string in order to translate it. There are also local to the message declarations. Local to the message declarations let you assign a value to a given name that wasn't passed to you. Um, so in this case, I'm from the date value, I'm creating a time value and it's formatted differently than the date. And I do that locally in the, in the, uh, the message. These values are immutable, both, um, both the inputs and locals, you can't be redeclared. So this is not a legal message where it defines time twice or change things. If you want to change things, you need to use a second name for the second one. So the other thing that can happen in a complex message besides declarations are selectors. You've already met selectors in the form of ICU's uh, plural formatter. Here is the equivalent of the message we saw earlier as an MF2 message. Um, and it has a, a match and then a series of when statements. Those when statements are called variants. They consist of the key when whatever the value is that you're matching and the pattern, that's the thing we're going to select for formatting uh, at the end. And the goal is to have one pattern to format. You can have multiple selectors and then the, the uh, variants keys have a list of values that are going to be matched. There's a one-to-one -one match between the, the selector and the column number uh, in, the, in the key. It could get written like this. It's maybe marginally simpler looking than, than the MF1 version, but not not so much that you wouldn't still claw your eyes out trying to work on this by hand. Uh, but we have optimized the syntax to allow you to do different things with white space. A number of programming languages let you do multi-line strings now, so you can make it pretty like this. You can also just make it pretty using plus and, and multi-line kinds of things like that as well. Hopefully resource formats will also support this in a more uh, approachable fashion. You can have an arbitrary number of selectors. As I mentioned before, they match, uh, they match one to one to the keys. If you don't have the same number of key values as you have selectors, that's an error. Put it, kind of putting it together, you can have declarations that move all of the goo, the, the setup goo for a particular value out of the way. And then it's repeated both for the selectors and in the pattern strings. And both the pattern and the, excuse me, both the selector and the pattern strings can override those if they needed to. So if you needed to say, um, you, know, you know, if you have driving directions and they get to a certain number and they're supposed to have tenths, you can do that, overriding it in the pattern. Um, you probably need to do some more things with your plural if you're doing that. Uh, but you can override the, uh, the input. As a reminder, plurals still exist. And I've been showing you all this English. Here is that message as Polish. You're going to generate a whole bunch of pattern strings. I didn't type them here. I could have. Um, but you're going to have a lot of pattern strings. So one of the downsides of all message formatters is this, this sort of generative explosion. With tooling, though, we at least can know that that source string needs all these slots filled in with something when you go to, uh, to Polish or Russian or whatever. Um, and so we can help people with tooling to generate all of the pieces that they're going to need for this string to work at the end. Our syntax is designed to be embeddable. So there's some things that you won't see in it that you might have expected. For example, there are no Unicode escapes. There's no backslash u stuff. The reason for that is message format pattern strings and messages are expected to appear in some file. And that file has a format and that file format almost certainly already has Unicode escapes in it. So if we define an escape, you'll have to escape our escape 
when you put it into, let's say, a properties file or a uh, .java file or a, a .js file, because the backslash in our thing means something in their syntax. So if you need a character, you just put a character in. If you need to escape the character for your file, escape it for your file, it'll be interpreted into a character for us by the time we receive it in message format land. We also don't have any character escapes except for the ones that are specifically meaningful to our syntax. The pound sign currently at the start of a message or the curly brackets, that's it. No other escapes are, are needed. Um, and then I mentioned we don't have ASCII quote marks. We use the pipe symbol for our quotes because pipe is relatively rare in text. Because if you use a double quote or a single quote, it marks the start or end of a string in many, many file formats. And so then you're escaping it. But then the escape is in your file. And now you have multiple escapes. It's, it's, a, it's a sort of a deadly whirlpool of escape mayhem. And, and so we've stayed out of that uh, by saying pipes for literals, double brackets for patterns. Those are pretty rare in, in normal text and, and escaping those is probably not as terrible. In addition to the syntax, we have a few other things. We have a data model, which you're not required to implement, but helps describe for implementers how things are supposed to work. It's very useful, uh, particularly when we get to some of the other, uh, the other parts. We have defined the formatting workflow and the errors that can be produced and what errors those are. Uh, and then we've described uh, format to parts, um, how the different pieces of a pattern um, can be can be spelled out into a sequence um, for formatting purposes. This is important because many, you know, in addition to the pattern itself, there are sub portions of a of a pattern that also might want to have formatting. So if you want your your currency values to be pretty and have different sizes, you need to know where the parts of that are formatted number in ICU already has those parts, but we need some way to get those parts all the way through the message formatter and not just flatten them out into a string. So format to parts describes how that works in addition to telling you, for example, where the boundaries of the different pieces of the pattern are. It also includes the ability for the first time in message format to do by die isolation. Um, so that you can either insert controls or to do markup appropriately so that you can not have spillover effects, which are really a problem with many bidirectional languages. All right, some hot topics. The audience participation portion of this uh, presentation. Here's a pattern and it's got three spaces on the front and the end. Um, there's two possibilities. One is those three spaces on either side are part of the pattern. And the other possibility is that we should trim them off because you don't intend them. Who is, who is smiley cat friendly or who is uh, uh, Android face friendly? Uh, who, who, who thinks we should, we should keep the spaces because they're part of the pattern? Appreciable right. number. How many people think we should trim them off because by God, those spaces should all, go, should all go away. All right, we have a good balance. You're mirroring my working group really well. Uh, what if I did this instead? That's a new line and a tab and a couple of new lines. Should I still trim those spaces? Okay, I see the same number of yeses and no's going on out there, all right. Um, here's something we settled Monday. Our syntax is the top one where we quote the patterns in complex messages. The bottom one is we quote the code and messages patterns are free to fly undecorated through the world with no, with no quoting around them and we trim off the exterior spaces. Is yours still the same? Who's, who's a face of triumph? Who is see no evil monkey? Do that again. Yeah. All right. 
monkey is. I'm quoting the pattern always. I, I sometimes quote the pattern, but mostly I just take all the spaces off and I quote all the code. Yeah, we we spent a lot of time with this. You want to vote? You want to vote? Yeah. See no evil monkey. All right. Pace of triumph. All right. We agree. We mostly agree with our working group. Couple other fun things. Uh, namespacing. Um, this is set to land as soon as I'm done talking here because I got check-in approval on it. Um, the ability to add, plug in things, um, we've designed a namespacing capability such that you can prefix functions and options, and I think annotations, um, with a prefix that lets you uh, um, have your own. And one of the purposes of that will be to add on skeletons for skeleton fans in ICU uh, versus the bag of options, which is what ECMA 402 has. No vote on that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> another thing that's also a hot topic for us is uh, expect an annotation. Um, there's a feature that we're talking about adding, which is the ability to override the locale um, and a few other things for a given placeholder. Um, here are a couple reasons why you might want to do that. Um, there's some talk about whether we might want to use this, for example, to import, uh, say, XLIF type of directives, um, possibly namespaced. So you can say this one doesn't get translated, for example, or this one's movable or clonable. Um, it's not part of the MF2 syntax. It's a thing that you could plug in. This is also close to landing, open and close support. Um, this is really interesting because it's very, very subtle in what we did um, or are proposing to do. These open and close placeholders are not part of the message you format to a string, they disappear, they're gone. But if you format the parts, you can get at the part and you could plug in a thing to generate HTML or whatever you could plug in attributed string to get an attributed string um this is there's a lot of interest in whether we can support kind of an, a pseudo markup language as opposed to using like templating languages to do this work for us whether you type the angle brackets in directly if you're making html so that's a really interesting thing that is in progress all right last piece the code mode switch. I've shown you message format two messages and all the complex messages start with an octothorpe uh, pound sign symbol like that top one there with the cat. The syntax actually says the second one with the Android face, which is double curly brackets to open, double curly brackets to close. Notice that that means there are four curly brackets to close most messages that are complex. Um, so that's another pattern. A third variation is just for giggles and grins, we'll add the, the pound sign to the other keywords or at least the ones that are our function introducers. So that's uh, alien face there, input local and match. Or the last one is we'll have some special mutant sigil. It was suggested that all message format two messages should have the logo, which means the, the FFFD character in the front. <laughs> which would be super interesting, <laughs> but not for any good reasons. <laughs> um, the pound sign seems to be like our favorite sigil when we don't know what else to put there. Um, so that's the current candidate for the introducer. Um, anybody got a preference? I have a number three, an alien face. Anybody like number two? Lots of curly brackets, couple people, couple people. Smiley cat. All right. Fake logo. All right, so we have no consensus yet. I'm free to do whatever I <laughs> can to our thing. So when will this be done? It sounds like, oh, there's a lot in flight. In fact, after three years of work, 
most of most of us are are significantly injured enough that uh, that the major battles I believe are behind us. Um, so I'm hoping to complete the specification in this calendar for the spring release. We will have a bunch of cleanup and test testing and other things in order to get this out the door by the end of the year. Uh, we had a super successful face-to-face, -face, if you count four people drinking beer and eating tapas in Seville a um, 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 couple of months ago. Um, we're looking forward to maybe having one in the winter. Um, it's been proposed to do it near my house um, because that's the cheapest for the retired guy. Um, uh, probably the weather will not look like this in January. Um, so we're still working out logistics. Um, so if you have time in January, look out for the date and location soon. We need you to participate in this. More people at this point is probably better to tell us how crazy we are. Um, so there's our, our GitHub. All the instructions are on that. Um, if you own an implementation or are interested in doing so, we would be fascinated to have you. Questions? I think there's still some rotten fruit out there you can throw. It's uh, you're all, all done. Okay, I'll take one from Nabosha and then we'll be done. How are we looking to adoption? Um, we will have an ICU implementation of both for Java and for C. Um, Emily Aro has done the proposal for Intel 402. Um, and so I'm, and there is a JavaScript implementation. I'm pretty certain we're going to have that. Um, after that, I'm looking for everyone who ain't nailed to the floor uh, who has uh, a need here. Um, if, you know, I think we have the PHP people are interested. There's a couple of other groups. Um, if you own an implementation where this would be appropriate, I am all ears to support you in, in bringing that there because I, I would like to see this be um, the syntax for your formatter. I don't care what language it's written in. All right. Thank you. Thank all you. Right. Thanks. So next up in this room, uh, we have Mike McKenna doing uh, the workshop Unicode and Beyond. And in the other room, we'll have Marcus Scherer talking about Unicode properties and algorithms.